water treatment. Uh, I've tried a lot of different kinds of, uh, of, of water, water treatment devices over the years and they're, they're really getting creative with it now. You're getting more and more, uh, more and more cool treatment things. But here's an interesting observation. Uh, I treat my water when I'm going in harm's way. But I have a lot of friends who they still will carry their water. They've got this technical stuff with them, but they don't trust it. I would say to you, I would say to you, first of all, the stuff you're buying is EPA approved. If you're going to buy it, trust it, use it, forget about carrying your water. Um, you can buy there's pumps, there's uh, there are th there are things that work on um, ultraviolet light. There's all sorts of different things. Uh, but when you buy a water treatment device, just be aware of one thing: if it has a filter, that filter has to be changed. That filter has to be cleaned. And uh, so when you look at the price of the thing, you might, it might be like uh, these copy machines. The filter costs as much or more, or more, more of the complete object. Um, generally speaking, I don't do a lot of water treatment. Uh, if you're cooking, you're boiling your water, it's a, it's a done deal. Uh, otherwise, I, you, don't want me to, you don't want me to mention any brand names, right? Um, you can. Well, um, the, the ones that I found, the top shelf ones are... Katie Dine makes a unit that costs three or four hundred dollars, and it has a ceramic filter. It's an awesome machine, but it's three or four hundred dollars. Okay, um, there are excellent ones that are made by MSR. Uh, Pure used to make uh, Pure used to make them. Um, the um, uh, the SteriPan, which works off ultraviolet light, is one of my favorites. One of the things that I think you're not going to like if you start getting into this water treatment stuff is any type of a, a, a filter, a purifier. Purifiers and filters are two different things. Purifiers kill bacteria. Filters just filter them out. But a purifier has to contain something that kills microorganisms. That's either going to be an, basically an iodine or chlorine-based system. And you're going to taste it. Even with a carbon filter on the end, you're going to taste it. I do not like that taste. Therefore, uh, I either a boil my water or I use something that is that is to that is that is totally tasteless. And and finally, I would say, you know, if you're going to go like to the boundary waters and you're careful where you take your water, you can get by without a, you can get by without a purifier. A simple filter may be all you need. You may not even need that if you're careful. If you're going to be canoeing on one of the Midwestern rivers, you know, Illinois, Indiana, or whatever, and you're going to be using water, yeah, then you better get some, some sort of a deal. I would suggest if you're going to be in the Midwest or whatever, uh, get a purifier so that you're actually killing the bacteria. If you're going to be a place like the Boundary Waters where the water is pretty darn good to begin with, you really don't need to, you probably really don't need to spend your money on a purifier. You can get a simpler filter. And the advantage of a filter is the water flow is way faster, way faster. Uh, so if you need the purification, go for it. If you don't, stick with the less expensive filter that puts out uh, more clean water faster. Cool. Just about everybody today has gone to LEDs. And I mean, that's a smart move. Uh, but be aware that you get what you pay for when you buy LEDs. LED lights are actually graded like diamonds. Uh, the most expensive uh, LEDs go into the most top-end flashlights, and the one you buy for a few bucks are generally not very good LEDs. So, you, you, one, you get what you pay for, uh, but the good news is LEDs outlast the I mean, bulbs by a long, long time. I would suggest for camping you go to lithium batteries. Lithium batteries just outlast the, not only do they outlast them, but they weigh half as much, you know, so that's a plus. Um, this said, I would say forget the flashlight, go with the headlamp, and you're fine. Uh, be sure the headlamp is waterproof. Be sure you can open up the headlamp and get to the battery without resorting to a bunch of sophisticated fancy tools and pry bars or, or whatever the case might be. Uh, and finally, if you want some nostalgia, something that's going to just sort of be cool, you know, don't overlook a little candle lantern. You know, you hang a little candle lantern in your tent on a cold, rainy night, and you get this beautiful glow that makes you understand and appreciate why you've gone camping to begin with. And secondly, it will add about 10 degrees of warmth to your tent. In fact, if you have some damp clothes, you can hang it up on a ridge 
run your little candle lantern in there, you know, and actually in a couple hours it'll be it'll, it'll be surprisingly dry. So a candle lantern will actually take the chilling edge off your tent if you go in the spring and in the fall. Plus the candle's good for something else too. If you can't get a fire going, you got a candle. Packs. A backpacker needs just one pack. A canoeist needs at least three, maybe as many as, as five or six, depending on where you're going. My advice to you is don't put all your eggs in one basket. In other words, don't go out and buy three high-end packs that are all the same, or three Duluth packs, or three any kind of packs. You want a soft pack for your personal gear, clothing, sleeping bag, and so forth, and you need some sort of a hard pack for things that are going to break. For example, uh, the Canadians are very fond of olive barrels, pickle barrels. Those work well if you have a good harness for them. Or box type things, you, or you can even get a squarish pack and you can do what we used to do in the old days. Just take a cardboard box, varnish it, and put that inside the pack uh, and, you know, and, and, and use that to keep the pack shape. So you want a diversity of packs. You want, a, uh, you want a diversity of soft packs. You want some sort of a hard pack in order to put breakables in, and then you want some sort of a day pack for incidentals like uh, rain gear, bug dope, sunscreen, and, and, that, and that sort of thing. Look around you and see what other paddlers are using, and you'll be on the right track. Clothing. <clears throat> um, the rule kind of in clothing for canoeing is, except in the heat of July, you really don't want to wear cotton. Uh, nylon and wool, acrylics, polypropylene, uh, those are fine. What you want to stay away from is cotton because when cotton gets wet, you, you have high, not only just a hypothermia problem, but it tends to stay wet. Now the exception kind of is if you're going to be canoeing an area where you're going to have fires every night, campfires every night, it's probably not a bad idea to choose like um, pants or something that have like some cotton polyester in them only for sparks. Uh, if you wear full nylon stuff and you get hit by a spark, bingo, you have a hole right now and you have a burn. So that's something to think about. Um, I'm a great fan of these mer of merino wool. Merino wool t-shirts, underwear, uh, everything merino wool. But it is expensive and if you're on a budget and you can't afford that, discover your local garage sale. You'll find all sorts of used woolens that people, uh, people have, have, have cast off. Um, and if you have children that you're taking, go to your discount store and buy them acrylics. They have all kinds of acrylic sweaters and acrylic shirts and things like that. Acrylics aren't as good as wool, but they're surprisingly good and they're really, really inexpensive. Um, rain gear, everybody needs good rain gear. You don't have to spend a fortune for it. Rain gear does not have to be Gore-Tex. It can be, it's fine, the new Gore-Tex stuff is very reliable, it's very good indeed, but you know if you're on a budget you can just get the simplest possible rain jacket and rain pants and you'll be fine. You don't need closures or zippers uh, down here. Zippers are the first thing to fail on a camping trip and you don't need any closure down here because primitive man learned a million years ago that water doesn't flow uphill. Those are things that are designed for mountaineering. When people are sticking their legs up in the air, I don't think you do that while you're canoeing. Uh, make sure when you buy your clothes you get them at least one full size larger than you wear. I sort of wear between uh, small to medium, everything I buy is large. So because you want to be able to fit, fit stuff underneath. Besides rain gear, what you want at least what I want, is a, uh, windproof sh a windproof shell. Just a simple nylon shell uh, that can roll to almost fist size that is not waterproof. Read my lips, not waterproof. It's hard to find anything today that is not waterproof. It's like, God forbid we get a drop of rain on our body. <laughs> but you're working hard as a canoeist. You're really working hard. You're going to sweat a lot. And to be honest with you, Gore-Tex just doesn't get rid of the perspiration fast enough for active sports. So you want a garment that will keep the wind off you, but one that will let perspiration out instantly. And for that, a little $30 or $20, whatever, simple, simple little shell jacket with a hood basically, uh, basically is all you need. Uh, you'll need gloves, 
Uh, you're going to need boots. You're going to need two pairs of two pairs of shoes, a pair of waterproof boots, and a pair of shoes for in camp. Um, or if you're the kind of person who likes to get their feet wet, um, a pair of wet shoes and a pair of dry shoes. And uh, that's that's pretty much it. Okay.